Well, I think I'll be there, God. It's my children that I love. This one has been a very long time coming, with the summer holidays getting in the way, but it was a delight to get back to and edit. The only slight problem was with our transcription software, which didn't recognise the word salamander, not even once. So you can imagine, what with the title being the salamander scientist, that that meant a bit of work for me. It also means you have an opportunity to win a little Two Scientists swag. Just email us the number of times you think we mention the word salamander at hello at twoscientists.org and next month we'll announce the person who came closest to the correct answer and ship out your goodies. Here he is now though, Christian Brown, the salamander scientist. to another episode of our Two Scientists podcast, where inspiring scientists share their work with you wherever you like to listen. Today's guest is a graduate student at USF, a biological researcher, a mentor, a teacher and activist. So that's a lot. Welcome, Christian Brown. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. So we're going to get into probably pretty much all of those things. But um, the key thing that stands out about your, you and your work is how does one become a salamander researcher and why? <laughs> and so essentially with that, I'm asking what inspired you to take up this kind of work and what was your route to get there? Yeah, that's a good question because I don't, I don't really know the answer myself. I just kind of pulled on a bunch of little threads and ended up here, but I was chasing scientific questions and salamanders happen to be really good vessels for answering a lot of scientific questions. It really helps that as a kid, I've always wondered where on earth amphibians go when you don't see them. So uh, when you think about amphibians and you tell people you study amphibians, they'll often tell you a story of a time they were out on a spring night and you know the salamanders were everywhere. They were out breeding and on the surface and that's a magical moment. But where do they go after that? I've always kind of wondered and even the, the best scientists that I could find would just say, oh, you know, underground. But what are they doing underground? Are they, you know, are they just sitting there? Are they moving around in like a labyrinth of cavities and tunnels? And are they living their lives down there? Are we missing it? And so I've always been curious about like kind of what they're doing when we can't see them. And I think I really got into salamander biology officially when I started tagging and tracking the salamanders, because at that point, you know, I, I had names for them. I had numbers for them. They were in my journal and I could go back year after year and find them in the same place. And at that point, it really kind of took off. All I thought about was salamanders, and, and here we are today. Yeah. yeah. So you say you have names for them. Were they like Fred and Bob? No, not exactly. <laughs> Usually 15-digit uh, alphanumeric codes, uh, pit tag numbers. So, so a bit less friendly. Unless they have some kind of really distinguishing feature. So I, I, there's a legend of, of Rita the salamander at the Mexican Cut Nature Preserve in Colorado. And mm -hmm. she's a tiger salamander who got over 100 grams. And so we took oh, pictures wow. with her. And, you know, she was a massive pedomorphic tiger salamander found at the top of a mountain in Colorado. And so uh, Rita, we definitely had a name for and a few others like that that, are, that distinguish themselves. But there's too many to keep tabs on. There's thousands of them out there. So, yeah. So before we start talking about your research, can you tell us what the defining characteristics of amphibians and specifically salamanders are? Sure, yeah. Definitely their skin. That's the first thing that people usually go to. So uh, they kind of have to stay moist. They breathe through their skin, especially these lungless salamanders that I'll be talking about today. They have no lungs. So they're not breathing oxygen the way we do. The oxygen is absorbed through the skin and the skin must be moist. And so that's kind of the first thing people associate amphibians with is moisture and aquatic habitats. Another thing is, you know, they often have to return to water to breathe. They don't have these like hard eggshells that a reptile would have. Uh, they don't have hard scales that a reptile would have. And they're much more aquatic than reptiles and other things like that. And reptiles have many more adaptations for living on land. So a lot of the distinguishing features of salamanders are kind of tied back to that moisture and that aquatic habitat. Yeah, so as someone who works on the lungs, it kind of freaks me out that they don't have any. <laughs> yeah, kind of ironic that I'm here with a lung researcher. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, the, the funny part is, well, I guess it's funny to me, but most salamanders, if you're going by number of species, don't have lungs. So the largest and most diverse family of salamanders on Earth is Plethodonidae, and that is the family of lungless salamanders. And, you know, they don't have lungs, they, they go in all these crazy places. And the ones I study don't return to the water, like we talked about. Uh, they don't have to return to the water. They can survive just fine on the moisture of the redwood canopy. And there's a lot of salamanders like that, and because of that, they've been able to pioneer a lot of different habitats. So you can find salamanders now in caves, plethodon and lungless salamanders, in trees. Uh, so all of these, you know, 
it, it's kind of, it's almost like it's freed them from an evolutionary constraint where they're able to leave the water. They still need moisture, but they can leave the water and seek out these new niches uh, and not come back to lakes and ponds and rivers and places that we associate salamanders with. That is very, very cool. Another thing that's very cool is the fact that in order to study yours, you mentioned in the little bio that you shared with us that you climb to the top of mountains and very, very tall trees. And so for me, I, I have a vague idea of what field research must look like because I have a few friends who go out and do stuff like that. But what does it look like practically for you? Because I'm trying to figure out, is it like a nature photographer? So you just kind of like hang out there for ages hoping to see one or are they everywhere or? That's a really good question. If you were to just climb up into a redwood tree, you would be sitting there for days waiting to see one for a few reasons. They're secretive creatures uh, and they also know that you're there. They can feel the vibrations in the tree. They're not going to just come out uh, right in front of you. You're a potential predator. And so, uh, yeah, climbing the trees and just waiting for them wouldn't work. And this was actually something that Jim Campbell Spickler figured out. He's a scientist, a wildlife biologist, canopy ecologist, and he's also the director of the Eureka Sequoia Park Zoo in California. But he figured out that if you you climb into these trees and you leave these crack boards, which are basically cover objects that uh, we rigged up to, to kind of meet the specifications of the habitat requirements of these salamanders. So they really like to live between freshly broken redwood and about one centimeter wide cracks. So any wider than that, predators can get in and predate them, uh, any narrower and they have trouble turning around and doing their thing. So what we do is we just buy redwood boards from the lumber company, which is, you know, kind of funny. We're buying redwood on the ground and tinking it back up into redwoods, uh, but we got to do what you got to do. Uh, and they have these little spacers in them that are one centimeter thick and the salamanders just crawl in on their own. And when we climb up into the trees to research them, they're hiding in there thinking they're safe. And we just open the, the door and we're like, hello. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's kind of crazy, but yeah, when we climb up there, we just have these little boxes and you just boop, pluck them right up. It takes a little while for them to, to season, if you will, up there and for the salamanders to find them. So you got to wait six to 12 months for that to happen. But once that happens and that happened, you know, we've established these boards decades ago uh, in the Redwood Canopy. Jim Campbell Spickler did all of this work. So yeah, I was able to come in and kind of build upon his science. And that's what science is all about. Uh, he brought me in under his wing. He taught me how to climb the trees. He gave me the confidence to climb the trees. And then, yeah, he showed me how to build the crack boards and, and make little habitats for salamanders to climb into. So when we go up, we just capture them from cover objects. And the cool thing though, is that we've been marking them with pit tags recently. And we just published a paper that shows that you can remotely detect them through the fern mats and through the bark of the trees. And so Yes, we catch them at these man-made objects and, and whatnot, but now that they're tagged with these pit tags, we can actually scan the tree like a metal detector, and it goes beep, beep, beep every time you wand over a salamander. So we're, we're learning a lot more about how they use the canopy habitat, uh, finding them away from the fern mats that we used to associate them with. That sounds very cool, and it sounds much more easy to describe to people than my research. <laughs> Yeah, it's, I mean, it's pretty rudimentary. Climb a tree, catch a salamander, my five-year-old self would be jumping with, with joy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's move on to the, what you're trying to achieve with these experiments. What is it you're trying to observe? Yeah, so we, we've studied a few different things, but ultimately, broadly speaking, we're interested in this really cool behavior where these animals that live at the tops of the world's tallest trees, they jump really, really readily. Like if you have them in your hand and you barely touch their tail or you just look like you're going to touch their tail, they'll jump right out of your hand. And where they're living, you know, that would have major consequences. Uh, so we were really interested in the jumping behavior and what happens after the jump. And so we looked at the jumping first and, you know, found out that they jump a little bit differently than other salamanders. Um, but ultimately, like we said, the goal was to figure out what is going on with this behavior, with this predator evasion tactic, what happens afterwards, and how does that affect the salamander? You know, because if you fall all the way to the forest floor, that could have major consequences for your survival, for your reproductive uh, fecundity, um, and therefore for your, you know, your genes and your evolutionary selection. And so, yeah, I guess if I could rephrase, we're broadly interested in jumping behavior in highly arboreal salamanders and the aerial behaviors that come for that jump or fall. So that's kind of what we're after, is just describing what happens to a salamander in the air after it jumps from a tree. And so that leads rather nicely onto how we found you. So I was just scrolling through Twitter and a bunch of some of the, the bigger Twitter accounts that deal with like naturalist stuff and wildlife and so on, they were sharing this really cool video of a little salamander in a what was essentially like a wind tunnel and this thing just floating there and it got so much kind of press I think 
And it was only when it got shared by our USF account, I realized that you're one of my colleagues, <laughs> which is why you're here today. Small um, world. Yeah, so we will definitely link to that paper and the little clip in the, the show notes so everybody else can see what it looks like. But what was it like to discover that? And how did you discover that? Oh, well, it was, it was a long journey. Uh, like I said, pulling on a lot of different threads that kind of led us here. And it was really exciting to discover this. We did not expect this to happen when we dropped them into that wind tunnel that you described. Uh, we expected that, you know, maybe they could keep themselves upright and, and maybe that would be about the extent of it. Uh, but to kind of bring you into that moment, the first time that we dropped one into the wind tunnel, we dropped a wandering salamander from, you know, the redwoods into this wind tunnel. It immediately righted itself, assumed that parachute posture, never flipped over and just kind of hovered in the middle of the wind tunnel uh, to the extent where, I, I don't have an exact quote, but my colleague, Dr. Robert Dudley at UC Berkeley, he exclaimed something like, holy cow, you know, <laughs> something like that. And I'm just a grad student. I'm not an expert in aerial biomechanics. Um, you know, I've always just chased salamanders. So when I saw Dr. Robert Dudley, one of my mentors and an expert in aerial behaviors say, holy cow, at the first salamander drop, I knew we had something and, and, and that excitement kind of lived on through that first day. We dropped another one and another one and another one and the same thing happened every time. They were in total control and you know what doesn't come through in the scientific papers are the, the things we don't really have data on that we just observe when we're there in the lab and so one of those things is uh, these salamanders knew what they were doing. They had done this before. Uh -huh. As soon as that wind tunnel was turned on and we hovered them over the middle of it, if they came in contact with that airstream, they started assuming these postures and behaviors, <laughs> even if they were still in my hand. Um, oh, wow. So there was something about that flowing air that w triggered it in them. It's instinctive. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's ingrained in them. You know, they live at the tops of the world's tallest trees and the crowns of the world's tallest trees. So if you're gonna find aerial behavior in any salamander on earth, it should be that one, right? And so that's kind of why we started there and they did not disappoint. And from there, we kind of tested a gradient of arboreality, uh, a couple different species of salamanders within the same genus and one from a different genus um, that are all different in terms of how much they use trees and how much they climb. And we found that the aerial behaviors actually track with the arboreality. So the more arboreal you are, the better you can parachute and the more often you parachute and glide. Uh, and as you get less arboreal, um, not only can you not parachute and glide, but you start to exhibit behaviors that we never saw in the arboreal species, such as flailing around or what I like to call inert falling, where they're just kind of <laughs> in a standard like ground position that you'd imagine a salamander on the ground being in, yeah. and it just kind of flips upside down and tumbles to the bottom of the wind tunnel and crashes and burns. So yeah, it was, it was that stark contrast between the highly arboreal salamanders that seemed in total control and never flailed and the ones that would go upside down and flail around and didn't seem to know what they were doing in the wind tunnel. That contrast really told us that there's something special about these arboreal salamanders and we're still trying to figure out like exactly what that is. So when you say arboreal, uh, blah, 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 you can say it because I can't apparently. Can you repeat <laughs> the word and define what it means? Yeah, absolutely, sure. So uh, arboreality in salamanders is pretty common in terms of just tree use. And so arboreality, we refer to you know, using trees. If an animal lives in trees or spends part of its life in trees, then it can be described as arboreal. And hundreds of species of these lungless salamanders have been found to climb, and many of them have been found to live in trees. But these specific salamanders live in the world's tallest trees and therefore would have the longest time in the air, uh, and therefore we thought would be the most likely to have some aerial behaviors or some kind of control over their descent. Yeah. So you talked about how this is very instinctive. So my friend and colleague Sue asked us on Twitter, do you know if this is innate or learned? No, no, absolutely not. That's what I, that's what I mean when I say we have no data on this. We were not okay. testing this. And this was not the goal of our research, but just, you know, between you and I, uh, two human beings, when I held this salamander into this wind tunnel, it was not even out of my hand yet and it was already assuming a parachute <laughs> posture. So there's something about the airstream. I'm not sure if it's learned, I'm not sure if it's innate, but you know, it's, it's interesting. So in 2005, Wassersug et al, they did a study where they put amphibians and reptiles into parabolic flight, which achieved zero gravity for a, you know, a few seconds. And they found that a lot of amphibians and reptiles with four legs assume a parachute posture in zero gravity. So yeah, I'm not sure if it's learned or innate, but that's another kind of interesting observation of salamanders that went to space, or sorry, of amphibians that went to space. I'm not sure if there were any salamanders specifically, but. Okay. Yeah. So when we're talking about parachuting, it's actually more like humans who put on these, what are they called? The weird suits where they can- Oh, wingsuits. Yes. 
Because at least for me, the impression I got from looking at that little gif was they, they spread out a bit like a human would in one of those suits. Yeah, so bringing up the wingsuit, that's, that's actually an interesting observation because there is this really cool trade-off in aerial biomechanics between maneuverability and stability. So having a wingsuit and having like skin flaps, like a flying squirrel, if you want to imagine a sugar glider or a flying mm. squirrel or a human in a wingsuit, this makes your morphology or your body shape very stable in the air. But there's a trade-off between stability and maneuverability. So these salamanders aren't really stable like that. They don't really have skin flaps like that. They're not kind of operating in the same way that like a drake a lizard wood or any of these other organisms that are famous for their their skin flaps uh, and parachuting and gliding it's more about like constant maneuvering so instead of being stable their morphology is a bit more maneuverable where they have these big feet on these long legs that get far out away from the center of mass and that gives them control over the center of mass so the longer you know the further from center of mass you get the more control of that center of mass you have in the air um, and so it's more like they have these big paddles and they use them they're constantly fine-tuning them and adjusting them even in the video that you reference it mm -hmm. looks clean that's the reason we use that one yeah. for the for all the footage or the press releases but if you zoom in and you look very closely that salamander is constantly adjusting its feet and its toes so they're just kind of doing like a, a maneuvering trick where they're just you know constantly maneuvering in the roll pitch and yaw planes so that they never go upside down and if they start to pitch or roll in one direction they actually use subtle movements of the limbs and tail to roll or pitch back in the other direction um, so they're constantly pivoting in all planes but it's it's this kind of balance that they can do. It's a balancing act in the air where they're constantly maneuvering their legs and when they have those big feet out on their long legs like that, it does, you know, in theory, this is what we're still testing this, but create drag, slow them down mm. um, and account for, for some of the parachuting. Yeah. Yeah. Today is one of those episodes where I wish this was a video podcast because you should be able to, you should see Christian with his arms out and waving his hands around. Like it, it's an excellent demonstration of what we wish the rest of you could see. So You've talked a lot about what you've done and how you do it, but what are the implications of your research? Yeah, so there's a few implications of, you know, of, of this research. The fact that salamanders can parachute and glide or have any aerial behaviors at all was, was sort of new to science. And, you know, people have probably seen it before, had observations, but we had never seen it described. And so just having some sort of aerial behavior or description of aerial behavior on salamanders on the books was the sort of the first, like, big finding here but really deep down like the implications are bigger than that because these salamanders are unique they do climb trees they do have very big feet and very long legs compared to other salamanders like them however they still have that super basal four-legged vertebrate body plan right it's a tail it's a body it's four legs and a head and so this has implications for all types of other organisms that we've overlooked there's not that many scientists climbing up into the, a lot of trees. You know, scientists live on the ground most of the time. There's a lot of great canopy biologists out there, but relative to the number of scientists and studies that we have on the ground, it's, you know, it's a fraction. Um, and so what remains to be seen is how many other unassuming species have cool aerial behaviors or have the ability to flip themselves over or parachute or glide that we just haven't looked at because they don't have skin flaps or anything visually you know cueing us into the fact that they might have those abilities so there's sort of implications for other organisms all types of organisms with four legs and whatnot and you know one of the coolest things i thought about this was it it's almost a new form of locomotion for salamanders because we've talked about this so far in the context of you know they jump out of the trees to get away from a predator and then they have to deal with the fall but we're not exactly sure how they use this in the wild. This is our best hypothesis because they have done it in our hand. Like, so researchers, while climbing the tree, have captured wandering salamanders. And while the wandering salamander was in their hand, they jumped out of their hand <laughs> and fell all the way to the forest floor. It was, you know, as somebody studying like the movement and the population, it was a horrifying event. But mm -hmm. it does show one thing, that they're not afraid to take a leap of faith if they think they're in danger. And so that is one reason for that hypothesis. However, there's a lot more going on in that canopy. There's a lot more than just predators. So you're an amphibian, you have to stay wet. You can't breathe if your skin isn't moist. But we live in a Mediterranean climate in California. So there's a few months out of the year, many more months now with climate change, where it's very dry and there's no rain. And so these salamanders, you know, that's one of their biggest uh, hurdles is, is not desiccating, not drying out. We have found dried out mummified individuals in the canopy. It is a harsh world up there. They have fern mats as refuge. So lots of arboreal humus and ferns and soil that they can hide in and, and kind of prevent themselves from drying out. 
But their name is the Wandering Salamander, and there's a good reason for that. They're known to just wander the redwoods, and you might wander up a redwood tree looking for more habitat. Maybe you're looking for a new fern mat, or a new mate, or more bugs. And if you wander up to the top of the world's tallest tree and you don't find what you're looking for, why would you waste all the energy and the time and the risk <laughs> of drying out walking back down? Yeah. So I really think what we found here, and there's no way to back this up yet, we have to do a lot of in situ field studies, but I really think what we may have found here is a new form of locomotion in salamanders. Dropping, parachuting, gliding from one fern mat to the other. They live in a very vertical habitat. So, you know, to get away from a predator or to find a new mate or to just prevent drying out in the upper canopy, it's much faster and much more efficient to return to the lower canopy on the gravity elevator than it would be to try to walk back down. And just to highlight a little bit more of USF research, Jessa Lina Retz, she was an undergraduate researcher here at USF Tampa and she's now a master's student at USF St. Pete with Dr. Allison Gainsbury. So she did a study on how these wandering salamanders from the redwoods climb straight up and straight down walls. And what she found, you know, I came in one time and I said, how's your research going? And she said, ah, not so great. And I said, what's going on? And she was like, I can't get them to walk down. <laughs> and I was like, what? You can't get them to walk down? Show me. And she put it on the board and she tickled the tail and do all the things we do to annoy salamanders and get them to do what we want them to do. <laughs> and it wouldn't go down, you know? Like they really wanted to go sideways or up or, you know, anything other than down. And she was able to force a few to walk down and we were able to get the biomechanics on that. And she published a paper in zoology that was really cool. But that is actually a super cool observation that they don't want to walk down. You know what I mean? Like, I think to me, that's a huge implication that in the wild, they're actually doing this more often than we might think. It might not just be that one time an owl is coming to get you. It might actually just be <laughs> seasonal. When that Mediterranean climate rolls in and you've been partying in the upper canopy while it's, <laughs> while it's rainy season, well, guess what? The springtails are drying up. You know what I mean? And you've got to return to that lower crown where there's more moisture, there's bigger fern mats. There's lots of data on that. We have great botanists up in the redwoods that have published lots of cool data on the habitat and the plants up there. And so I think they're dropping from the upper crown to the lower crown. And it's sort of like a new form of locomotion in salamanders. So so to me, that's the coolest implication, but maybe not the broadest. Yeah. yeah. That's... Sorry, I talk a lot. No, no, no. You're good. <laughs> Doing You're all good. Right. I'm also thinking of me as a human and how I do the exact opposite. Like if I'm going to do anything, it's going to be the elevator up and walking down the <laughs> stairs, right? Well, and if there was an elevator up, perhaps they would. Yeah. But this is true. Yeah, exactly. And so one last implication of this research, and this one kind of for me and for the herpetologists out there that are like really herpetology nerds. Uh, if you're a big herpetology nerd and you knew about these salamanders, you probably knew about the big feet and the long legs that I've been talking about. And you probably read in a lot of those field guides that that was for climbing, that that was an adaptation for climbing. But here's the question I would like to ask all of my fellow herpetology nerds out there. If that is an adaptation for climbing, then why don't the other hundreds of species of salamanders that climb have long legs and big feet? Yeah. And I think that perhaps it's because there's something else going on that these ones also fall and jump out of the world's tallest trees. And so in theory, that selection pressure to me, like if I think about, you know, selective pressures of big events, falling out of the world's tallest tree is going to have a bigger impact on selection than if I climb a little faster or slower. And so the implication of this research in the herpetology world, if you are such a herpetology nerd that you know about the feet of salamanders, then you might be excited about this research because it kind of means or could mean that their big feet and long legs were actually an adaptation for falling and gliding and parachuting and not for climbing, but they happen to help with both. Yeah. I guess it's much more dramatic to think about. So we obviously, we live in Florida and the trees here are by and large, they're very small. And the redwoods are absolutely enormous, right? It's still on my wish list to go and see them. But yeah, it conjures up a very vivid image of how far they must be coming down and exactly how sure they must be that they're going to survive that fall. That's right. Yeah, they're mind-bending trees. The height is amazing. Uh, so the tallest one on Earth is about 381 feet. So imagine a 38-story building, but it's a tree. So these trees That's are absolutely nuts. massive. And if you're a listener in Florida and you are here at USF, I think the best thing to do to try to imagine this is to go into a cypress forest. So the bald cypress is actually in the same family as the coast redwood. And so they grow very similarly and they both have, you know, fungal resistant properties. And yeah, they're kind of similar to redwoods. So go look up, you know, look up the trunk of the tallest cypress you can find and then double or triple that. Uh, and imagine a salamander jumping and falling that distance. There's a lot of time there. There's a lot of time to maneuver. There's a lot of time to flip yourself over. And there's also a lot of time to, you know, start moving a little bit horizontally. So we found that when they fall, they can achieve about one meter sideways for every 10 meters down, which might not sound like much, but if you stand back and look at a coast redwood tree, their, their native tree, 
it's perfect for the shape of that habitat. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you drop 10 meters in a redwood, but you move a full meter over while you're doing it, you're much more likely to hit another branch or another fern mat on your way down than if you were to drop straight down. So that subtle glide angle, just a few degrees, five, six degrees, doesn't seem like much, but it's just enough and it can make all the difference to prevent them from falling all the way to the forest floor, which the number one question I get there is, well, is that because it would kill them? That fall would kill them? And the mm -hmm. answer, is that we don't know we haven't tested it for ethical and <laughs> logistic reasons yep. but in theory no it would not kill them the the redwoods have a nice soft kind of redwood duff forest floor and the salamander only gets five or six grams and so it shouldn't necessarily kill them unless they land in like a fast flowing river or on a sharp rock or something like that but these sub lethal effects would be astronomical you're now separated by you know a hundred meters from all your mates you know you're you're separated from your niche and your food and there's other predatory salamanders that live on the forest floor there's the pacific giant salamander that can get up to 18 inches in length and it absolutely would eat a wandering salamander if it got the chance so staying up in the tree is a way to keep you safe from other salamanders competition and predation um, and it's a way to like live amongst your mates so you can easily find a mate when the time comes and you don't have to go very far because you could dry out if you do very nice yeah. so they essentially have their own little tribe up there yeah, it's all them. In terms of the salamanders, it's a free-for-all for Aeneides vagrants for the wandering salamander. There's no competition for them in terms of salamanders up there whatsoever. And there is a boom-bust cycle with the springtails. And we know that springtails are very important food for terrestrial hatchling salamanders. Um, one other interesting thing about this species I should mention is when they come out of their eggs, they're just like mini adults. They're called oh, wow. direct developers. Yeah, okay. so they, they don't actually have a tadpole or a larval stage. They're just called hatchlings for a while and then they get big. And so, yeah, when they hatch, they're, they're literally hatched on a vertical surface so the oh. the females will lay eggs i've got a video on youtube if you want to check it out it took her uh, over a day to do it but so it's a time lapse yeah so google anides vagrans ova position or egg laying or something like that or wandering salamander laying eggs and you'll find it on youtube but i said all that to say that they lay them on vertical surfaces these eggs and when the hatchlings hatch they're literally born onto a vertical wall onto a vertical world and so that's what i mean when i say that this seems instinctive, this seems innate in them. Being vertical is innate to them. Being on vertical surfaces and high up off the ground is just something that comes with being a wandering salamander. One of the things I was going to ask, which is that every, every scientific activity really is either about data collecting or about theory making. And I belong to the theory making side. I mean, as a scientist, you can be involved in both parts, mm -hmm. but most of us specialize in one side or the other. So Pamir, for instance, an experimentalist, her job is to do experiments and collect data. And there's a bit of theory making in the sense that obviously you have to make sense of the data, but you don't spend much time thinking of big equations. Whereas in my case, actually I don't spend much time thinking of big equations because I'm not smart enough, but I do come with computational models. Yeah. My work is get data and then trying to figure out how does that fit? Like, what does it mean? Try to sort of make something out of that. You do collect data. It seems to me like a lot of the fun part that you're describing is going to California, climbing up trees, trying not to die. Look at these beautiful creatures who wouldn't die if you push them because they know how to fly, which is amazing. But then you go home. I mean, you, you are a USF. You do research in California. I expect that most of your time you're not really in California. That would not be... Correct. Yes. So what do you do when you're here? Yeah, I love that you brought that up because... You know, the video that we talked about so much of that salamander just crisply floating through the air in the wind tunnel, that video was collected four years ago. We just published this. <laughs> and when I first, you know, quote unquote, discovered this, you know, I would tell people about it and scientists would be like, okay, well, you know, what's the data? Like, how much is it slowing itself down? And I would be like, no, 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 just look. I would just like hold the camera up. You know what I mean? Like, no, you just look at it. See, it's doing it. But yeah, we actually did it's have to yeah. crunch the numbers and, and it's not trivial. We had a lot of those videos. So what I do with most of my time here at USF is when I'm done in California, with it, done with the animals, done with the wind tunnel that I use at UC Berkeley, I come back here with my videos and, you know, a few animals too, to collect some extra data if we realize we missed something. And I go through those videos painstakingly. I mean, days and days and days worth of video crunching like i did the numbers one time and it was like oh i have like 256 hours of video analysis to do this month or like something crazy like that yeah. um where i knew i had to dedicate like entire weeks to this and so basically what it involves is running these videos in through software and then you follow points on the salamander and you mm. create like digital pixel points and then you can convert those to real world points and get like actual distances because you know the scale and so 
you can then 3D reconstruct these salamanders' movements within the wind tunnel. And once you've 3D reconstructed them, you know, you can write all types of code and you can, every single video, I can basically plug into some code, you know, hit some buttons, type some things, and the next thing you know, we have like accelerations, velocities in all directions, mm -hmm. X, Y, and Z. You know, we've got glide angle, we've got horizontal velocity and horizontal acceleration, which would kind of imply like how far did they move sideways in, that, in this amount of time? And how far did, would they have fallen down in that amount of time? So we get all these cool like mathematical variables, kinematics, if you will, Yes. on like speeds and angles and then that allows us to actually say yeah I have this video sure I can shove this YouTube video in your face and say look at it yeah it's it's, it's <laughs> gliding great. but now we also have the numbers yes. to say yeah but it was also going 10 meters per second when I first dropped it in and now it's going 8.9 so like that's kind of cool it's slowing yeah. itself down more than 10 percent um, and so yeah the numbers really helped us contextualize like what's going on because it all happens in the blink of an eye we have to film this at 500 frames per second and because of that all of my videos are like six gigabytes I have so many hard drives it's ridiculous yeah. so part of my work at USF is basically just like living with my hard drives in the lab <laughs> and in my bed at home all night long. Like point tracking is what we call it. And you point mm -hmm. track the salamander's movements and you get the kinematic data. Yeah. Because yeah. obviously a paper is not going to be here is 200 gigabytes of videos. It's going to be here is some videos we took, but obviously this is what it means. This Correct. Is, why are we interested in kinetics? Do you guys do any biophysics as well? Because it feels to me that probably the morphology, the, the shape of these animals might actually play a big role, right? That's an awesome question. So that's actually what I'm doing right now. Once we figured out that they could do this, then the next question was how, yeah. right? How are they doing this? And I talked a lot with Parmvir about the, you know, the big feet and the long legs. And that's my hypothesis that I'm currently testing. Because I read in a fluid dynamics textbook by Vogel that, like I said, the further you get from the center of mass, the more control you have over that. So you can turn better and, you know, flip over quicker and do all these cool things if you have longer legs and get further from your center of mass. So to test that, I've linked up with the Ryan Carney lab. He's in IB, but maybe also USF Health. Um, he does dinosaur reconstruction stuff Ooh. and also does mosquito-borne diseases and jack-of-all-trades. His graduate student, Alex Kirk, is the TA for Digital Dinosaurs. He's like an award-winning TA for that class. And I was talking with him about that class one time and I said, hey man, I should take this class and then my class project should be the salamander. Yeah. And he said, don't take the class, just come to my lab. Yeah. So I'm now collaborating with Alex and he's really nice. helping me a lot where we uh, laser scanned the salamanders, which are euthanized, right? In, in these parachute mm -hmm. postures. So I euthanized them because that's the protocol. Once you collect an animal from the wild, you cannot put it back because you could spread diseases and kill thousands in, in the wild instead of just the five I collected for the whole four years I did this yeah. project. So it's a lot better to just collect them and euthanize them in the lab, even though it's a bit harsh. So I euthanized them and then I fixed them with formalin in these parachute postures. Mm -hmm. And then we scanned them with lasers and then we brought them into Maya and some software like that and we made a mesh and so now what we're doing is we're using computational fluid dynamic software ANSYS mm. Fluent and imagine a car commercial and they're trying to show you how aerodynamic the car is and they have all these like colors flying over the car and those are showing you where it's got drag and where it's really smooth and sleek we're doing that with the salamanders and we're basically seeing like where are the positive and negative pressure areas and therefore I guess in, in non-fancy terms where's the lift being generated mm -hmm. here and you know, just a sneak peek, we haven't finished collecting the data, but our preliminary results are suggesting, I think more than anything, it could be their flattened body. They have a really flattened torso, which has always been attributed to climbing and squeezing into cracks. That flatness really influences aerodynamics. There's a whole chapter in that fluid dynamic textbook. Uh, there's a whole chapter about things going around, things that are round versus flat. And so a lot of salamanders are round and these salamanders are flat. So I think that's a huge thing in terms of their aerodynamics and we sort of have the data right now to prove it and we're working on that now. Like I said, Alex Kirk, USF Biology, it's kind of a collaboration between the Carney Lab and the Deban Lab. I'm really excited about that work coming out, yeah. So salamanders in general, not just the ones you study, but in general they do live in lots of different habitats. Yes. Can you say that the taller, that the higher they live, the fatter they are? Hmm. That's a really good question. So yeah, the taller that they live in the trees, would they be flatter? And uh, the answer is I don't know, but yeah. that is it's, something it's, that could easily yeah. be answered with like museum work. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, specimens in jars that were collected throughout the last couple of centuries that are just sitting there on shelves in museums. I could easily pull them out and measure morphometrics and, and even run genetic tests and kind of see like if there's any kind of like correlation, like you said, between arboreality and, and body flatness. That'd be a really good idea. But we talk so much about these salamanders, this North American salamander. It's really important to emphasize that some of the coolest arboreal salamanders in the world are down in Mexico. They're these bolidoglossans. Uh, they're also lungless, but they live in bromeliads and banana trees and stuff. Mm -hmm. Sure, they fall off of those too. Uh, and a lot of these have like webbed feet or semi-webbed feet. 
So one thing I'm really interested in doing possibly for a postdoc is trying to identify like the genes behind webbing mm -hmm. in salamander feet and then seeing if that correlates with arboreality and aerial behavior. So yeah. it's something I think about a lot. So change back a little bit. What were you before you started your PhD here? So before my PhD here, I was in a master's program at Humboldt State, and that's where I Which fell in, in love. Oh, it's in California. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, Humboldt State so University. Are you from California originally? No, I grew up in a like an Air Force family, so we moved oh, all over the place. But I did my master's there, spent three years there, and that's where I kind of fell in love with the canopy world and and with the salamanders. And the reason I came here to USF was Dr. Steve Deban's work. So if you look on YouTube, I'm always talking about YouTube here. <laughs> We're flooding YouTube with salamander videos. Yes. Try and stop us. Bring uh, more of those. I think YouTube needs more salamanders. <laughs> I videos. agree, yes. absolutely. Uh, I'm helping with that. So, Dr. Steve Devan, uh, he actually did a lot of work on uh, ballistic tongues in salamanders. Mm. And I looked at those videos and I was like, huh, that's a small salamander doing a very fast thing. And I don't know if I mentioned earlier, but part of the reason that it was so hard to study this was if you drop them and blink, you missed it. They fall very quickly. Ow. So, that wind tunnel video, uh, it's like it's in slow yes. motion, yes. there's wind below it, slowing it down. So, the only reason you saw it for that long was the scientific equipment and the slow motion camera. But I had to come here to USF to learn how to use all those things. I had never used a slow motion camera before. So Dr. Steve Deban is an expert in biomechanics and morphology, and he studied salamanders too, and he had lots of fancy cameras. And I reached out to him and uh, he made me an offer. And yeah, I was like, I never thought I'd live in Florida, but yes. here we go, yeah. Because I was just thinking, why would someone at USF decide to study something that is only reachable in California? It's a great question and unfortunately this is something in academia that happens too often. When people ask about that I often like to tell them the story of a lab <laughs> in Oregon that studies brown and knolls. <laughs> and they're all over our backyard mm -hmm. and we're down here studying the salamanders that live in Oregon. So yeah, maybe some scientists should link up and trade salamanders and lizards, you know, things like that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's all about like your mentor and your department and where somebody got a job. So yes. yeah, you'd think like, oh, somebody who studies canopy salamanders must live with the canopy salamanders. But unfortunately right now, I do not working on getting back there if I can, yeah. Cool. Sorry. So clearly you're very, very excited about your research, which yes. is awesome. All scientists should be. It, it would be sad if you're not. It's, it's <laughs> like, it's thrilling, yeah. It's truly thrilling. I know that another thing that's really important to you is conservation. And it just so happened by another complete fluke, I've been following the, um, the Save USF Forest Preserve hashtag, and I've been on their Instagram account, if you go and check out our pictures for this episode, you will see that Christian's wearing a t-shirt dedicated to that. So can you tell us about the work that you started doing there? How did it start up and what's the importance of what you do? We've been talking so much about how I became a salamander biologist. I should mention that my undergrad degree was in conservation biology. I never intended to end up here and that's the way life should be. But yeah, I, I have a degree in conservation biology and so I've always been interested and passionate about this. And when this issue came up, when the request for information was first published for developers and the USF Forest Preserve came under threat last year or two years ago, I got together with Jeannie Munger and Stephen Hesterberg, which are fellow grad students or now alumni in the IB department and we sat down in the middle of the preserve and we just said like what are we going to do how are we going to save this place so can you explain where it is first of all so the USF Forest Preserve or as they call it the North Fletcher property is a parcel of land that's about 700 acres a little bit more it's right across Fletcher from Carlton Arms Apartments in Temple Terrace. It's just west of Lettuce Lake Park and USF Riverfront Park. And so the USF Forest Preserve is a super important natural laboratory and also a super important resource for the Tampa community. So it's not just USF, it's not just USF students, it's everybody who lives in Tampa that benefits from this forest preserve. The students get a natural laboratory that has all sorts of native Florida ecosystems. We have Sand Hill with endangered gopher tortoises and wild flowers and we have oak hammocks and, and palm hammocks and, and we've got lots of cypress swamp and tons of unique animals and plants to show the students um, and a lot of students that live or have graduated and live around Tampa, Zoo Tampa, the Florida Aquarium, they have told me that they get jobs after talking about their experiences in the USF Forest Preserve. It's hands-on stuff, it inspires them, it gives them confidence and it, it gets them jobs. So you know it's really good for the students but it's also good for the community. It cleans the water, it cleans the air. For instance the other day you probably didn't hear about it because it's no big deal because the forest preserve was there to help us out about this but they had a spill about 20,000 tons of sewage spilled
built at the end of 56th oh. Street, right there at the Forest Preserve. And, you know, if the Forest Preserve wasn't there, the next thing is the Hillsborough River, which is the, our source of drinking water in Tampa. Uh, so you didn't hear about that story because it's no big deal, because we have a wetland and a USF Forest Preserve there to absorb that sewage and filter it out for us and take care of it. So it's a vital resource. If you like wildlife, if you go to Lettuce Lake Park and you like to look at the birds and the alligators, guess what? They don't just live at Lettuce Lake Park. They don't stay there. You know, when the sun goes down, they don't all just go to bed at Lettuce Lake and wait for you to come back. A lot of them cross the Hillsborough River and they nest and they breed and they live in the USF Forest Preserve. Um, I run the game cameras back there. We have bobcats, we have otters, um, you name it. We've got everything back there. And it's a really special resource because it's actually a wildlife corridor that connects all the way back to the green swamp which is a core conservation area of Florida. So if you're not familiar with the core conservation plan, we have all these core conservation areas through Florida and we're supposed to keep them connected with corridors. And this is a way for humans and wildlife to coexist. So wildlife can move between the major parcels of land and habitat and resources in these wildlife corridors. And the Hillsborough River provides sort of a natural wildlife corridor from the Green Swamp all the way down through Temple Terrace you know, to the USF Forest Preserve, and the USF Forest Preserve is responsible for then linking that wildlife corridor to the Cypress Creek Preserve, which goes all the way up into Pasco County. So if we destroy this preserve, if we build on this preserve, if we do anything other than leave it alone or manage it for wildlife, we will lose and sever a connection between Cypress Creek from Pasco County, the Hillsborough River, and the Green Swamp. Um, and that's gonna have serious implications for the wildlife that you see and serious implications for a lot of other things, traffic and other things like that. It's a natural barrier sort of between the interstate and New Tampa and, and Fletcher Ave. So, you know, we talked to Dr. Robin Ersing at USF um, and she said that it, it could be a nightmare if they build there and put more roads through there, uh, that it's kind of like a natural barrier that keeps the USF community. Um, the USF community is buffered from a lot of this traffic and a lot of this new construction through the USF Forest Preserve. So it's, it's a parcel of land it's here in your community and it's doing stuff for you whether you know it or not and i like to tell people that what happens at the preserve affects things as far away as the andes mountains because we have nesting swallowtailed kites that fly into the preserve and they go as far back you know in, in off season in the winter they'll fly as far back as the Andy mountain Andy, andes mountains <laughs> yeah. so is it the lack of corridors the reason why alligators end up in people's swimming pools yeah, yeah. So human wildlife interactions, undesirable ones like that, are absolutely a product of destroying wildlife corridors, not giving animals and wildlife the space that they need to move between habitats and developing in places that are encroaching. And so, yeah, wildlife interactions is just one of many negative consequences of development and, you know, short sighted leasing out the land for development for short term okay. economic yeah. gain. Right. When we have you know, there's so much more value in that land than economic. There's teaching value, there's cultural value. I haven't even mentioned the cultural heritage sites there. You know, there's evidence of human inhabitation there for the last 10,000 years. It's an incredible archeological and scientific resource and natural laboratory. Uh, and USF seems to be doing the right thing and, and they're, they're moving towards, you know, formalizing it as a natural laboratory, hiring somebody to manage the land. And, you know, we're very uh, eager to be a part of that movement and also keep their feet to the fire. Yeah. So, I mean, I know you're talking about economic gain, but I think there are economic impacts by stripping people of this, because obviously the effects that you're talking about will affect people's health. We know the issues that come from stripping away swamps and mangroves and things with regards to how then our properties flood when the, the hurricanes and the storms come in. So, you know, you do have the negative economic impacts of those things, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a lot more expensive to try to clean it up than it would be to, to keep it intact. Yeah. So, like the example with the sewage spill, a lot more, you know, expensive and, and a lot bigger deal to have to clean up things out of our river than it would be to just keep them out in the first place. So there's definitely econ economic implications. You know, everybody's in it for their own reason. I'm in it for the animals and the wildlife but it affects people too. And um, whether you know it or not, like I said, the USF Forest Preserve is working for you. Yeah. yeah, so what is the status with regards to whether it's going to be developed or not right now? <sighs> so the, <laughs> That's a big sigh. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's a never ending battle. We know that the Forest Preserve has been under threat many times in the past, and we know that it will be many times again in the future. And that's the crux of it. That's the issue. <laughs> That's why we really need permanent, like legal conservation easements or protections or something that's, you know, something that will enshrine that place in law, something that will keep that place there for the community for years and generations to come. Because without that, you know, land is only getting scarcer. 
developers are only getting hungrier and what's going to happen in 2050? What about 2100? Are we going to have the same people in charge? Are we going to have the same people running USF? Are they going to make the same decisions? The answer is probably no. So if we don't protect this preserve properly, legally, then we have issues. And so that's why I sighed. <laughs> that was the deep sigh was that the fight is never over and that we don't really have anyone other than the county of Hillsborough on our side when it comes to permanent legal protections like conservation easements. The University of South Florida has done a great job in, in nixing the RFI. So they did say we don't want any more requests for information from developers. That was a great step. We applaud that. They did say no, we're not going to move on any of the proposals that we did get. That was a huge step. We loved that. They formed a committee and they did put somebody from our, our activist group on the committee and they had the committee assess the property. That was very cool of them. I don't want to get into the nitty gritty of that assessment or if it was good enough, uh, we have our, our qualms about it, but you know, they're trying, they're making an effort. But the current threat and the current status of this fight, we don't know if it's a threat or not. That's, that's exactly why I sighed. So the University of South Florida and you know, the College of Arts and Sciences, they're now tasked with managing this land formally. They've never been tasked with that super formally before. It's just kind of been like, hey, biologists, you want to take care of this land? And we were like, <laughs> yes. But that kind of fell through the cracks with a few retirements. Um, and so now with this whole push to nix the RFI, they formally made it ECOR and they, they're appointing a land manager, which again, we applaud. We love all of these efforts. They do want to build a 5,000 square foot research building. We do not know where, we can't really get a solid answer on where, and we don't know if they got the funding or not. And so that's kind of where we're at in terms of the USF Forest Preserve right now is the most likely development that will occur is actually by the USF College of Arts and Sciences, which are the very people that were saying mm. we cannot give another inch. Last year when this was, you know, an RFI for developers, they said that we shouldn't build there. Now they're telling us that we should build there, put this research facility there, and that this building will then protect the land forever oh, because it will great. mean that, oh, there's important science going. I was told that the building would give the land legitimacy, which I disagree with on a moral ground. And so, yeah, I wanted to start with all the things that they've done well. And, you know, we're working with USF. We love USF. We love, you know, College of Arts and Sciences. We want to all work together and get to the same place, which is students learning on this land forever. But they refuse to talk about conservation easements. They refuse to talk about any option that relinquishes their control in any way of that land. And so what we're seeing, I guess, is just a struggle between some of us who just want the land protected no matter what, and some of us who have to look out for the bottom line of USF. And so, yeah, of course we're working together, uh, but the current threat is a 5,000 square foot research building that may or may not have been approved or gotten funding. We're still waiting to hear, and we can't get a clean answer on whether or not it would be in the Sandhill habitat, which is exactly what we just fought to protect. Oh. And even if it's not in the Sandhill habitat, if it goes anywhere other than already developed land like USF Riverfront Park or the Claw, like the golf course, then it's going to have an impact. And 5,000 square feet isn't just 5,000 square feet. You need a parking lot. You need a road. Yeah. You need, you know, lights and facilities and construction trucks. And so all I want is to have a conversation about core conservation areas, edge spaces, and the impact that all of this is going to have on those things. Because I'm a conservation biologist at heart, and that's my undergrad degree, my bachelor's. And the problem that we're encountering as an activist group right now is that we were told, now is the time to apply for the funding and we'll work out the details later. And if anybody doesn't like me saying that, I'm sorry, but that's the answer we were given and they stuck by it. And so if they, they must be proud of that answer. And so yeah, right now they want to build on it. They want to put their own research building on it. And we're not against a research building. I want to say this very clearly. We are not against a research building. That is a fantastic idea. We could have so much more impactful research back there and it would help to protect that place. But is it a guarantee? No. And have you just started something? Yes. Now you've put your building there. Who's to stop the next person? What about the next college that comes along and says, well, we want our building there. USF College of Arts and Sciences has got to do it. Why don't we get to do it? You know? So the idea that putting a building there to stop buildings from being put there <laughs> is just not something that we're ready that we're ready to get on board with. But we are willing to hear them out and we are working hand in hand and we're just waiting to see where that goes right now. So if you're a follower, if you're listening, if you're part of the Save the USF Forest Preserve fight, just make sure you're on the mailing list. Nothing is going on right now in terms of protests or letter campaigns or, or anything like that, but it could be soon. And so just kind of be ready. If any funding for any kind of building goes through, you better believe that we'll be against it unless it goes in a place that has already been impacted, such as Riverfront Park, you know, the front of Riverfront Park, not the back forested area, 
in the golf course, things like that. We just want it to go in the right place. We love the idea of a research building. We just don't want any buildings being put at the USF Forest Preserve. And we're worried about putting a building there with no legal protections and what could happen yep. decades and centuries from now. Yeah, so you actually beat me to the punch. So you gave me some action items that maybe people can try and help out. And again, we'll put some more links in the show notes and hopefully people can find out more and help you out because it sounds kind of desperate. I will say that we, we the train has stopped. We yeah. were basically standing down a moving train last year, this time yeah. last year with that RFI. And with the change in administration, that was a big change in administration with that change uh, and with their new stance on the RFI and not considering it anymore, we consider ourselves not to be in as desperate of a place as we were this time last year. We talk about that often, that we're very lucky that the train has stopped. And our goal now is to dismantle the tracks. Okay. Very good. I like to end on a positive note. We've had this with a couple of podcasts recently where it's just like, oh man, this is so heavy to say goodbye. In the Can world we, we live yeah. in, especially scientists, it's going to be hard to end your podcast on a positive note. I'm is sorry. It, that's I that's know, the... I know, right? Uh, yes, but on that note... <laughs> Well, uh, we'll, on that we'll, note, we'll take what we can get. So, Christian, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate you taking the time out, given that we know you have like a teething three-month-old at home and are probably not sleeping very well. Yeah, thank you so much again for speaking with us. This was a lot of fun. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I think I'll be a preacher. It's a good book that I all right, one time USF had this dilapidated herpetology collection, and somebody was saying, like, oh, we need more space. I'm going to throw out all these old jars. And I was like, no, like, these are valuable specimens from the 1960s. You know, we could do look back studies. This is data. We need this. Don't throw these out. And they said, fine, then you're in charge of curating the collection now. You need to go through the jars and make them usable for students, and then we'll keep them and then we'll use them for teaching. We'll actually teach a herpetology class with them. I thought that was a good idea. So I spent about 100 hours doing this, volunteered my time, and had a lot of undergrads that would help out for experience and stuff. And it was a great experience overall. But one night, I was very tired, and this curation process involved me moving specimens from one bucket to another, and the buckets contained like ethyl alcohol and a little bit of formalin that was coming off the specimens. Uh, that's what I was trying to get off for the students. Put them in ethanol instead, less carcinogenic. Yeah, so nasty chemicals. You don't want formalin anywhere near you, right? And I should have been wearing goggles. I should have a lot of things. There should have been, that's what I mean. I, I don't know if I even want to tell this. Like somebody at the USF Research uh, Approval Board is going to be like, no more research for that guy. So it's late at night and I'm tired and I have to move these specimens from one bucket to another. And I, I don't know why, but I dropped this heavy lizard into the formalin ethanol mix a little bit higher than the surface of the liquid and it splashed back at me right into my eye and it burned and so i'm like remembering the training videos of like you'll be blind forever and i'm like oh no so i run over to the eye wash station which i've never used and so i pull this thing and it starts flying out i mean like across the room like in the air like a, imagine you're a five-year-old and your your parents put on the sprinkler for you to run through that's what's happening inside a classroom at usf i'm the only one in there it's like 11 p.m and yeah i'm trying to rinse my eye out and it's starting to feel better and so i'm calming down i have my face in the in the eye wash station and i'm like all right you're good you're good you know like all i'm worried about is like will i be able to see out of my right eye when i'm done washing it out and when i'm finished i'm like oh okay i can see I look around the room, everything is soaking wet. I mean, cardboard boxes full of microscope slides for teaching labs and teacher's equipment and like, you know, personal products and like everything in the lab, the tables, the benches, the floors, everything is wet. And so I guess the moral of the story is like, don't rush. Even if you're tired and, and you're in the lab late at night, like do your protocols the way you're supposed to do your protocols because I ended up having to stay until one in the morning cleaning up all of that water so that nobody would know that I flooded the room trying to wash my eyes out after splashing chemicals. You've been listening to an episode of Two Scientists, directed, edited, and hosted by me, Panve Bahia, with a guest cameo from co-producer David Basanta Gutierrez. The gorgeous bit of Americana you can hear in the background comes courtesy of none other than Christian's brother-in-law, Ryan Culwell. You can find links to more of Ryan's work in the episode show notes. Make sure you also check out our website, twoscientists.org, to find more fun links to Christian's work, including his paper, 
and some videos of flying salamanders, as well as all the links to the USF Forest Preserve, where in particular Tampa folks can keep up with their campaigns. I think I'll be a killer It's killing that I love I'm still my body's in the dirt I pray to God that nothing comes up pray to God that nothing comes up You look great for someone who's clearly not getting much sleep. I appreciate it, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe even the beard hides a multitude of sins. Oh, I hide behind hair a lot, yeah. <laughs> hair and hats. That's, you'll see in a lot of my pictures, hair and hats. <laughs>